I'm Joe Kane. I'm Dan Kane. I'm Sal Conca. And I'm Wayne Heckler. And this is The Imperfect Podcast. Be sure to check us out at hecklercane.com and everywhere on social media. To the bumper. Today we're here with David Bousquet, director and director of photography and editor of the short film Lookouts. David Bousquet is a uniquely skilled director, editor, and photographer who uses that range of experience to communicate and translate his ideas into visuals. He's worked in advertising as a director and director of photography for broadcast, web, and retail campaigns, both nationally and internationally. With a BFA in motion picture, David has led and directed teams of talent in all areas of filmmaker. filmmaking. Wow. David, welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. <laughs> Happy to be here. Hello, gentlemen. Great to have you. We appreciate you hanging out with us on a Friday night and uh, talking to us about your new film, Lookouts. Uh, we're excited to hear all about it and, and how you came up with the concept for the film. Um, yeah, for but sure. We'd love to dig into some of your background first. Um, it says here you have a BFA in motion picture. Where'd you get that? Uh, there's a film school out here in San Francisco called the Academy of Art. It's actually it spans all forms of uh, of arts, but I got into the film program. It's actually where Kristen, who produced the uh, the film Lookouts, uh, also my wife, um, that's where we met, and we sort of began in doing kind of spec commercial work all through the uh, all through the academy. And then after graduating, that was a natural segue into uh, into doing it for real. We were actually approached by some clients and and some agencies uh, based off of how we were sort of doing short format storytelling. And uh, and it kept us busy for 10 more years. Wow, that's awesome. That's a great story. I mean, that's it's kind of what we're trying to do, <laughs> oddly, oddly enough. Um, I have a marketing background, and we've been dabbling with the idea of getting into commercial work and things like that to kind of pay the bills to fund independent films that we want to make. So Certainly, is- yeah. It's a lot of the game out here. I mean, in San Francisco as opposed to Los Angeles and other areas of, of California, there's really there's a lot of agency work. There's a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of different industry, industries that sort of uh, have have intersecting uh, relationships out here, both uh, in, in advertising and in marketing, we strictly kind of stay on the advertising side. But, but yeah, the game as opposed to narratives, as opposed to, to television, it's really sort of uh, ad work out here, and, and we kind of fell into it. That's cool. So what was, your, what was the first project you guys worked on? Oh, that's a good one. Um, it <laughs> was, whew, it was a... Uh, Z4 spec spot. That was. I, I would say we we worked on a handful of of shorter projects, just kind of when we we're getting to know each other. But when the first official uh, spot that Chris and I actually did, that we kind of stamped our names on, was a uh, was a spec spot where we actually it was just before the release of, of BMW Z4, and uh, we sent a pitch down to down to Design Works, which was kind of uh, BMW Global's design branch in Southern California. And we said, hey, we want to do, you know, we'd love to get uh, a car from you. <laughs> it's a pretty ballsy play. But uh, we'd love to get a car from you and, and just sort of make a spec spot. We had a concept of how we were going to shoot out by a lighthouse in Santa Cruz. And they went for it. And they gave us, uh, they gave us two cars and we drove them up and, and shot this kind of mock commercial that all had this like shark theme. It was all shot at night. We lit, you know, we lit this lighthouse and just every, you know, every whack job across the beach was just coming out of the woodwork to harass us. But uh, it was a blast, you know. I, I, even my father was out there doing security. And uh, <laughs> it, awesome. was, it was a ride. So, yeah, that was one of those film school stories. Sure, a whole family endeavor, exactly. <laughs> yeah, from the start, man. Yeah, from the start. It was, uh, it was kind of all hands on deck. And ironically, even even in some of our client work, moving into, into you know, deeper into the professional lives. How did you get into this field? Like, did like you always talk- like film? What, what is it that sparked you into this um, profession? Yeah, no, uh, good question. It, it's actually because it marries so many of my interests. And uh, I think film, I've been a fan. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself the, the hugest film buff, but I'm certainly a fan of all the creative arts that kind of pull together into filmmaking. So I've, I've been an illustrator my whole life, uh, hugely interested in photography. Obviously, storytelling is a, is a major a major passion. And that the act that film takes these static arts and translates them into moving visuals has always been the draw for me. It's like always translating in something into a, into a visual because that's kind of how I picture it in my head. I don't really picture it as, as static art. And, and so that's, that's the challenge of it, but that's always been the draw. 
Cool. So, I mean, being that you're so into photography, the visuals, obviously for the lookouts, was they were astounding. Um, it was shot beautifully. Thank you. Um, and I've seen some of your commercial work. They're all, you know, very clear and bright um, imagery. Joe is our resident gearhead. So we'd love yeah. to know, you know, kind of that, how do you use technology and what type of gear do you use um, to bring those concepts to life? Yeah, for sure. Now, hey, fellow gearhead over here, I love uh, I love talking uh, lenses and and you know sensor formats. It was all shot on on Red Epix. Um, we had we kind of began with the uh, the MX sensor on uh, on our Red. We, we, we use a primer a Red primarily our own, our own camera for our commercial work. But uh, we had two on set while we were doing that. Halfway through the shoot, they were upgraded to Dragon sensors, which uh, I was a little. Uh, we're cautious about initially, but uh, but ultimately, I think I think it, it kind of blended fine for the film and, and worked out. And then in terms, so everything was done uh, at six K. And then for the slow mo stuff, um, that was that wasn't like post Twixt or anything like that. That was actual Phantom four K flex. Um, we were shooting upwards of a uh, thousand plus frames for some of those really like heavy debris moments. It was kind of fun because we were rolling the reds and the phantoms at the same time. And, and even in the final edit, I didn't initially intend on using both footage, uh, both, you know, both cameras actually for some of those moments, but for, for the big blast of debris that hits uh, Chris, the Ranger in his face in the close it's like the fourth shot of the film. Uh, we cut for a real quick moment back out to the, the full 24 frame, uh, a second red camera and and you can just see the the violence of what he's being hit by and that guy i mean if ever there was a testament to an actor's performance he was opening his eyes as like buckets of sand and debris were blown via leaf blowers directly into his face the guy was just <laughs> that's so awesome that's a yeah. trooper right there now that video yeah. was fantastic excellent i mean you captured that great i mean the photography is incredible very Thank impressed you. with that Thank you. Now, thank now you. before was, we get on to this story, I do want to ask you one question. Um, what is a basilisk? I didn't say it right. I didn't, say, I didn't it right. say it right. Oh, my God. Oh, man, I ruined the whole thing. <laughs> nice setup. Wayne goes to set things up and then blows it. I it's did. really good. <laughs> I got too excited by putting the accent on. I just so, couldn't pull it off. <laughs> No, uh, you know what? By even asking that question, I mean you've you've hooked into the the root of the story. That's that's the whole arc. If I'm if I'm allowed to use the arc word, uh, that's that's what the story is about. It's you open with the question. We've got those bookended visuals of he starts by running away. He's final visual. He's running at it. And he's running at it because he knows what it is. It's it's fate. It's potential death. It's all these it's all these other lovely things that. 11 year olds should be facing. <laughs> now, where does the basilisk? How do you say it? Bas Bas basilisk. Basilisk. I practiced yeah. it and I can't say it. <laughs> the basilisk. Where does, where does that come from? Where does that come from? Yeah, it actually it exists in mythology. It's not, a, it's, it's not a creature that we created. In fact, I think even Harry Potter beat us to the punch on this one. But uh, the way, what I think is fun about it is it's been interpreted a number of different ways. Some people see it as more of like a, a serpent-like creature. I think that's the route they went with, with the Potter series. And uh, to me personally, I, I think being pecked alive by a bird is just a little more horrific and, and not casting judgment or anything. But, uh, but yeah, the, I, in terms of what our creature was going to be, I wanted, I wanted to play off of the, uh, the awkwardness and the clumsiness of birds like like roosters and and if you were to make like a, a two-story rooster with all all the strange kind of mannerisms and jittery uh movements and then just the notion that it, it pecks its prey apart as opposed to this sleek elegant serpent-like dragon that will just swallow you whole and that's a much more pleasant way to go <laughs> i mean these are, these are dark things to delve into when you're thinking about your monster but uh but to, we kind of went there just to clarify for anybody who's listening um uh, david here he wrote he directed he was the cinematographer and he was the editor for this uh short um the lookouts uh it's, it's the the visuals on this are absolutely fantastic, David. Uh, we were totally blown away when we saw this thing. And oh, hey, thanks, man. That's awesome. Yeah. The, the, let me ask you something. Who did the um, who did the CGI for the Basilisk itself, and how much input did you have into that? Obviously, you, you, you gave us a little bit of input as, as to what your vision of the Basilisk was. Yeah. Well, credit where it's due, um, because this was all based off of the Penny Arcade comic. They kind of steered it down that bird-like path initially. When you look at the the expanded uh, 
comic, not not the the single page that we based ours, our, uh, excuse me, that we based ours off of, but when they expanded into, I think it was a six page or something, a uh, slightly longer story. They did have some visuals of the Basilisk, and and it's it's hyper stylized and very cartoony and a lot of fun. But it definitely goes down a rooster route. So that's that's what kind of planted that initial seed of like, well, let's keep going down this path. Like, you know, dragons are awesome, and and when you say uh, when you say dragon to people, I think it paints a pretty clear picture in their head. But but a rooster dragon, like, what does that include? If you <laughs> yeah. start go down the, the feather route over scales. If you go down these kind of like bird beak and, and these mixture of hard and soft surfaces for the head, what does the function of the crown? And then when you play in all these other, you know, in the actual mythology of the creature, the fact that it's kind of like Medusa, where if it looks at you, it can turn you to stone. Uh, it all sort of played into how we were going to design uh, sort of the, the, the geometry of the face and what the proportions were and how it played in silhouette. So, sorry, going back to your original question. Um, who are the CG guys and, and how much influence do we have? Uh, the design was, was for the CG sculpt was completely based off of the physical puppet that we made here, uh, in house, literally in house, in our house, in our garage. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, yeah, they, they used, we used a ton of photography. Uh, the, the, the physical puppet is basically the collarbone up. So, it's about a quarter scale, I imagine, of what the actual creature would be. The thing was ultimately uh, five by five. It was. It's kind of a, a larger um, object, but it could still be puppeteered by one uh, by one performer. And then and then using that as kind of like the collarbone, the shoulders up of the design. The rest of the body, I did a uh, a rough uh, CG sculpt in in Cinema 4D and shot that to our guys. We had a team in Argentina that did uh, a lot of the visual effects and some of the initial sculpt of the creature. And then when their time and and the, the money allocated to those those artists sort of ran out we began parsing it out to to individuals and uh, the final sculpt and animation was done by a, a talented gentleman in in singapore and then there was uh there was an additional level of lighting and texturing actually done here locally by a, a contact that we got through um tippet cool so yeah you cool. find in a lot of these uh the things where you're you're creating a creature out of nothing that it's so important to get it right to make it look like it's a part of the world that it's in and it's so important to make it look like something that could exist that um i i gotta give you credit that th this thing looks real mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's it's <laughs> unbelievable huge, it's 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 really top notch yeah and um you know it's I, I have so many questions i want to ask you i don't even know which ones to start with yet it's like um I, I guess i'll go with you mentioned in your um description on vimeo that uh you guys were inspired by jim henson's creatures and for me i don't know if i i i, I kept thinking about the dark crystal and sure yeah it's fixed. yeah you know and i don't know if that played into it but it, was there something by jim henson in particular that you know what what of jim henson's work inspired you for this film no the the skixies are, are absolutely were in the back of our head and i would say awesome. so much of his his library of work was uh was at front of mind during the making of this thing for, for me it was to have that hands-on process i mean uh i I love what's being done in the digital realm right now. I love I love what people are able to make uh, in terms of, of CG work and and a lot of you know set extensions and, and digital replacements for for the physical. But at the same time, I mean I'm I'm still a lover of the physical craft. I'm I'm a lover of all these like like I led with. It's it's the various art forms that blend into filmmaking and and model making and puppeteering and and uh, the the sculpting tools and the painting. To me, that's still so much of the art form. I, I don't want to uh, supplant all of that with what can be made in a computer. And so, when we tackled this project, it was it was about creating a balance. And certainly, with the creature, uh, I, I hope I don't stand alone on this, but but I may mm -hmm. that anything in a close up always plays better when it's physical. I mean, sure. I think uh, yep. I I like following the. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of films that do it, but I think I think some of the 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 series you know the big franchises right now i think of films like underworld and stuff like that where mm -hmm. where they really have committed to physical puppeteered uh you know uh body suits for mediums and close-ups and then for the more dramatic you know full body 
um, movements and when the camera gets wider and into extra wides, they go with the CG. And, and maybe that attitude's changed, but I think the, the, certainly the first four films have spoken to that process and it just looks fantastic. And it captures light in a way that only the physical world does. And uh, even on the small scale of our film, we wanted to recreate that. So um, again, apologies if, if this is running long, but uh, no, when it wrong. comes to the, thank you. Well, uh, when it comes to the puppet itself, we knew we wanted that. And the first three months of, of the film's project, actually two months leading up to production, and then through that first month of production, which was eight days in Mendocino, and then a handful of pickups, certainly the, the two days that we did in the studio here in San Francisco, we had this puppet being created, and we were going to, we were going to film it after, after we had done all the principal photography, and it, and it showed up, and it was, it was not something that we could use. It just wasn't, uh, wasn't camera ready, and, it, it, and although it ate up our entire visual effects budget, um, it, you, know, you can't have a shitty monster in a, in a monster movie. I mean, you gotta, yeah. you got to do it right. Um, and I think oh, that's, language. I think should, should, I, uh, should I pump the brakes on those naughty words? No, 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 um, no, no, no. We're, we're not censored. <laughs> no, you're oh. fine. Um, right. But I think that's My part of. Maybe this thing, so I'll be careful. No, <laughs> you're fine. I think that's part of. I think maybe why it felt so warm and fuzzy to us because it was this throwback of you know using puppeteers and not so much CGI, so it didn't feel fake. You know, and it's kind of like the way we grew up watching movies, and you could feel that in in the way you guys produced this. Um, you know, I think you, I think you said somewhere it, it, you just mentioned it took uh, about eight days of shooting and two days in studio and things like that. But how did you guys, in terms of the production process, did you guys privately fund this? How is how how did you guys come about making the movie? Yeah, it everything was out of pocket on uh, for Chris and I. I mean, we paid for the entire piece ourselves. So that you know that was that was one of the realities of of tackling your own passion project. Part of going into this and. Not to, not to sound jaded or anything, but we were coming out of 10 straight years of, of commercial work, which had a lot of highs and, and a lot of just coming to certain realities of not having the final say in projects. And, mm -hmm. and I'm very happy with those experiences. As you know, you guys are all nodding your heads. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, yeah. what, what, uh, ca what captures me immediately is the lighting and the smoke in the forest. It, right away, you feel immersed in it. So I just I just really felt it. The second I saw it, I, I got to watch this to the end. I was very excited by this. I really think uh, you got a home run here. It shows your skills as a director, um, a DP. I, I just, you know, I can't over overpraise you but i'm very impressed with this i really am thank you so creating that visual tone and trying to keep it consistent is uh i mean you guys can speak to this you're all in this field it's it's not easy and it's no. uh especially when you're when you're going the fantasy route i've got a we did, we did a little making of book and there's kind of an anecdotal story in there about that fog that you're referring to and that one of the reasons we wanted to shoot in mendocino we've always had mendocino in the back of our heads it's this like beautiful place to to, to capture visuals is because it is so atmospheric. It's right on the water. It gets that cool coastal um, mist and, and fog rolling in every night and lingering throughout the mornings. And uh, and that sold us a lot on the place. Not to mention that you, you know you've got California redwoods. It's like you're shooting an indoor. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, so uh, so we go out there in the actual the, the eight days that we were filming there were were incredibly hot. I think there were some of the hottest days that they certainly had in, in, in recent years, if not on record, and it just obliterated all of all of that beautiful moisture we were banking on. And so we we had uh, three high output foggers just cranking away nonstop through the whole thing. Always in the background, people crisscrossing, the wind shift, we'd have to move everything around. And uh, you know, you need that a redwood force as gorgeous as it is to the naked eye when you put a lens up it's it's just noise it's just visual noise there's just detail everywhere and nothing pops against it and aside from creating the atmosphere which i, I appreciate you acknowledging and, and pointing out um it, it it creates some depth in the frame you gotta you gotta take your actors off the background and and it's it's a win-win that we sort of had to create for ourselves yeah. Cool. Definitely. So, um, in terms of being uh, this passion project for you guys and wanting to, like, obviously, just divert yourself, give yourselves a break from the commercial work that you do. You know, it came from the Penny Arcade comic, like you mentioned. Was it something you had read? Was this a childhood comic that you knew about? How did you actually find the story? Did somebody approach you, or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, PA. I've been reading. I mean, since college when I was. 
playing video games with my roommates basically i mean you, you follow the the gaming comics it was kind of uh uh, mid 2000s so that's that's you know that, that was big stuff you got Scott Kurtz and, and some of the other kind of godfathers of the, the web comic industry uh, pumping out a lot of great work and Penny Arcade was one of them and and they had done these sort of one-off stories um, as passion projects of their own even though their their day-to-day uh, you know the three-day comic was, was supposed to focusing on the gaming industry, they would do these sort of short story bits just to see what people thought, and, and sometimes they'd expand them to something larger. So in, in 09, um, they made the first Lookouts comic, and it and it really excited the fan base, and uh, they since turned it into one of their larger properties. And because we had sort of kept, kept Penny Arcade in the back of our heads, as if we were gonna do one of these passion projects for ourselves, if we were gonna do something where it's, it's all money going out, no money coming in, uh, pure art for art's sake, as naive as that sounds. Uh, I wanted to do it for a property that kind of had that mentality from the start, and that's what Penny Arcade has done. They, they've been entertaining myself for the last 15 years or more, and we've never met. You know, all the work they do is free, and they put it online, just like you guys are entertaining folks online for free. And it's and that that builds loyalty, and it and it creates an awesome fan base. And I wanted to thank them in return for that with with the 10 minute short that. You know, at the time of its creation, they hadn't been t- adapting any of their material into motion. And since that's you know the sandbox that we play in, we thought let's uh, let's grab one of their works and turn it into motion. Is there a game plan for this to become a full length feature? <laughs> yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of talk going on. Um, this PA, they're you know they're they're a le- legit company, uh, and they've got big brands, and they've got a lot of demand. Uh, on their art, and they're also writers. I mean, this this is very much their baby. It's one of their two flagship properties, and so it's it's in their court to turn this thing into a uh, into a feature. We we have a license for the short film, but we don't have the the film rights. But we have certainly talked with them. Obviously, there's a great relationship there. Um, they heavily support the film. They've been pushing the film, and they'll likely use the film when when the feature length script uh, is fully formed and. As much as I can say right now, it's it's that uh, things are are the plans are looking good for a positive answer to that question. That's <laughs> so, awesome. Sadly, it's not my answer to to give. Though, no, of course. <laughs> well, we wish you a lot of luck. We hope. I mean, I, I, if that that comes to fruition, we'll definitely be watching the full feature because yep. yeah, I even I even got my mom to sit down and watch this short today. So that's that's <laughs> that how much <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, that's awesome. That is awesome. I mean, for Chris and I, our 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 time spent with this with this property or 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 certainly with uh with wherever this relationship is going it it may end at the short film and that's a lot of what the function of of the film is supposed to be is just Mm -hmm. to be get out there and get people to watch it and enjoy it and uh whatever happens happens you know it's 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 a piece of art that we wanted to put out it obviously shows off your talent too so very, very well done it, it does function as kind of like a 12-minute business card, and that was very much by design. <laughs> it, which is ironic if I could riff on that for a second, because we, you know, that story structure, the design of the film, is absolutely intended to leave you wanting more. And if there's anything I'm most proud about this story, it's that people say, uh, "I want to see more." They don't say what happened to this, or where did that go, or why, what about this, or why not that. It's I want to see more, and the entire the entire design of the film is to lead you to wanting to see more. And and if there's a success in the the storytelling that we pulled off, it's in that. Yeah, definitely. I think that's that's one of the key components there because you built the story very quickly. You understood exactly what was going on. I mean, you know, it wasn't a trailer. It was it was a short film. It had a it had a uh, beginning, middle, and an end, and and you, right. you got the story across. But it still yeah left you with that feeling of wanting more. Um, yeah. Are you, are you guys submitting to any festivals? We we are and we have. It's it's okay. It's been the byproduct of of. Honestly, this if, if the ball was dropped and it was, it was seriously dropped like through the floor at times with this project, it was on the back end because we weren't sure uh, how this thing was going to be responded to. And honestly, because it was such a, a passion project, this was such a thing that we just needed to experience the act of making it. It wasn't about what we were going to do with it afterwards that uh, the level of preparedness in terms of what our game plan was from a festival standpoint, from a a PR standpoint, 
is just uh that's been the biggest learning lesson so you mean the marketing guys weren't up to the more didn't have the marketing all worked out (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, exactly well you know what i'm gonna gonna, (laughs) sorry i I, I didn't mean to bust your chops sal is our marketing guy that's (laughs) why (laughs) that wasn't that wasn't meant to bust your chops i never claimed to be a marketing guy absolutely (laughs) in advertising i'll make the content i'll leave it in your hands to figure out what to do with it and unfortunately (laughs) We, uh, we had no one to figure out what to do with it, and it was left to our devices, and which means we did nothing with it. But it's all evenly branded, and <laughs> from an advertising standpoint, yeah. like it's a, it's ready to ship. But uh, we'll talk. Yeah, I'll be I'll be ready to I'll be prepared to run your Twitter account at any time. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it did show at the, uh, so we got accepted to the LA International Film Festival. We, we've only been sending it to festivals that are Academy qualifiers just to, just to see how it plays. Cool. And uh, so it, it had its public premiere, uh, or rather, uh, rather it had its, inter- its worldwide premiere at the LA International Film Festival uh, in September. And then two days later, we actually flew to Seattle. There's, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the gaming convention PAX. There's a, a PAX West, a PAX East, a PAX South. Um, it's it's like E3 or, or Gen Con. It's one of these big gaming, oh. gaming conventions. Yep. Um, but uh, it, it it showed there, so it closed out the opening ceremonies um, on on the first day in front of a you know uh, a, it was the symphony hall there, so it was like thousands of people. I got to sit in the room and watch it with. It was just fascinating. It was wonderful. Nice. It was an amazing experience. And then we had a a, a panel discussion uh, the next day where some of the hardcore fans. And uh, and fans of uh, of the other series that PA creates, and then just people who like the the film itself, were were able to sit in a room and talk with them, and that was incredible, also. So it's had a it had a great public launch, and uh, you know we immediately went into scramble mode once it went live online because again, just not not PR ready, sure. and uh, so we're at we're at about week three of of that process, and. It's it's slowly you know the the dust is settling. So I've cool. Well, I've, we're so happy to be one of the first to get you on. I'm sure you're going to have a slew of interviews and junkets and uh, you know other things to do uh, and and keeping you busy. Um, I know Chris- anyone, anyone who gives me a chance to just riff on the thing. Uh, I, I like talking about the film, so it's, <laughs> it's something to be proud of. I hear you. <laughs> Well, I know Kristen couldn't join us. Uh, she's your partner in crime, so to speak. She's your wife and, and partner in the company with Redgate Films. So how is the dynamic working with your wife all these years? Yeah, she's very sorry she couldn't be here. Um, and she's unbelievable. I think everybody kind of has a, a, a skewed perception of, of what a producer is or what they do, what they do rather. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and certainly in, in our lives, in the commercial end of things, when we – kind of wear so many hats from a production standpoint. We've got a wonderful roster of people that, that uh, we build out our teams on a, on a per project basis, but it's generally from a director producer standpoint, it's the, it's she and I, and uh, she, her history is, is in all areas of filmmaking. We both started as editors. Um, I kind of branched into photography. She started going into the, uh, just because she's a wizard with a calculator and a, and a cell phone. She, she went the money route and, uh, Thank God that she did because, uh, <laughs> you know, we would never come in on budget or on time without her. Um, but uh, in addition to that, not that not that there's anything to be taken away. But that's that's ten people's job. Uh, a, a true producer's job is just an enormous amount of work. She also has her hand in so many of the creative aspects of the filmmaking. So when I said that we made that that you know that creature puppet in our garage, that was Chris and I working in our garage for six months learning how to fiberglass for the first time, learning how to, you know, we figured out how to do uh, foam latex runs, encapsulated silicone, built an oven just to just to do the bakes, which were like 18-hour runs, and we were trading off all throughout the night, like checking in on this this thing because it was like a little turkey thermometer stuck in the top that you had to check every 20 minutes. <laughs> Is there any behind-the-scenes? So, so, uh, did you guys do any filming behind the scenes of you guys working in the garage? Uh, we'd love to see that as true movie, <laughs> as true movie geeks. We'd love to see the, the making of Basilisk. You know what, man? Just coming out of that process with my marriage intact was a win. <laughs> <laughs> we all understand uh, that. There's the, quote, there's the quotable moment we've been looking for. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it just... Uh, uh, you know the the pho- I'm really glad that we did get some photos through that process. But if ever there was a a trying moment in the process of this uh, of this film, that was it. You know, coming off of a pretty 
there were there were there were smooth and rough rough spots through the whole uh, principal photography. But yeah, once it once it hit the creature stuff and everything ground to a halt, that's where you're you're really looking at each other and just watching the money go out and wondering if this thing's ever going to get finished. And uh, and it was rough. So I'm happy that we at least have some photos. And yet uh, she still talks to me. And you, see, and you see it was well worth it. When you look back, you know, it brings a great memory that you guys put that much heart and soul into the project, especially building a boss. How do you say it? Basilisk. Just kidding. I got it that time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, very impressive once again. Cool. Well, it's going to be, I mean, we don't have, we don't have kids and we don't have pets, but we have that monster and that is our baby. There you go. Is that still residing in your garage? Is that... <laughs> Yeah, you know, we actually, as a result of the film, we we wound up getting a uh, a storage container, like a you know, like a shipping container, out on Treasure Island, just to, just to put all the crap in mm-hmm. all those stacks. <laughs> <laughs> all full size we've got breakdowns of those huts jammed in there and so in addition to to some of our our, our crap from from other advertising jobs it's just loaded with like memorabilia from this film the, the grip house actually little giant lighting and grip who who are absolutely unbelievable they are one of the core reasons this film ever got uh finished or even started from the beginning joe mendoza was the the the, the gaffer through the entire shoot and the, the first ad through the whole film uh, they are. They've off, well. They've requested to have it hanging in their in their shop, and I think that's a pretty pretty solid long term home for the thing. So eventually it'll go up there. Nice. Very cool. cool. David, uh, uh, you know we we really appreciate you coming on the show. This has been a, a pleasurable experience for all of us. If you haven't checked out, if you're out there and you haven't checked out the lookouts, check it out on Vimeo. Um, the David is the director of photography, the editor, and the writer of the short film, and it is quite a film to check out. Um, epic, if I must say. <laughs> David, thank awesome. you so much for being there and um, and talking with us today. Yes, thank you. And Basilisk. Just want to say it. There you go. I said it. <laughs>